The programmable read-only memory device offers one major advantage over the ROM device in that it can be programmed by the end user. But like the ROM device, once it is programmed, it cannot be changed. The memory configuration of a programmable read-only memory device is very similar to its counterpart, the ROM. The primary differences are that each bit contained within a ROM device is manufactured to represent a high output. Another difference is that during the construction of the ROM device, each connecting diode contained within the memory array will have a thinner layer of conducting material attached to it. This thin layer acts as a fuse link which will open to produce a low state when the device is programmed. A factory fresh PROM can be programmed with a PROM burner. The PROM burner is a specialized piece of equipment designed to generate high energy pulses which destroy the desired links to match the contents of the user's data file. Programming the PROM is a very simple process. First an address is selected by activating the desired row and column lines. Then a jolt of high energy is applied at the desired address. This causes the thin layer of conducting material to burn open. When this occurs, it permanently opens the circuit between the row lines and the column lines. This same procedure is performed at each data address until the entire PROM device has been programmed. While the device is being programmed, the outputs are generally disabled. Here you see the PROM burner connected to a typical programmable read-only memory device. As you will notice, the PROM burner was connected to the outputs of the PROM device. Also notice that there are two memory-enable inputs on this device. One is labeled ME1 and the other is labeled ME2. When the PROM is being programmed, either ME1 or ME2, or in some situations both ME1 and ME2, must be brought high. As was stated earlier, when the PROM device is manufactured, it contains a high at all addresses. Therefore, the logic lows must be programmed into the device. To program a logic zero, the following procedure is generally followed. First, a voltage of 5 volts must be applied to the VCC input. Next, select the word to be programmed using address inputs A0 to A7. Third, apply a logic 1 to either or both of the enable inputs. In this example, we applied a high at both enable inputs. Fourth, apply the high energy programming pulse to the outputs where the low bit levels are desired. Next, advance to the next output and or word, programming only one bit at a time. This sequence is continued until the entire PROM device has been programmed. This procedure is a basic process used to program PROM devices. However, when programming a given PROM device, it is recommended that you follow the manufacturer's guidelines. To verify that the PROM device has been programmed, apply a logic zero to both of the enable inputs, then check for a low output at the desired address. Programmable read-only memory devices are slightly more expensive than ROM devices, but their flexibility often justifies the higher cost. We will now pause for a short review of the programmable read-only memory device. The programmable read-only memory device offers a tremendous advantage over the ROM in that it can be programmed by the end user. The PROM can be burned or programmed only once. Once programmed, it cannot be erased. To program the PROM, a special piece of equipment is used. It is called a PROM burner. The factory fresh PROM consists of a matrix of fusible links. An intact link produces a binary one whereas an open link produces a binary zero. PROMs are programmed one bit at a time. This concludes review number two. Next we will examine the EEPROM. 
The EEPROM, or Erasable Programmable Read-Only Memory Device, has been the preferred method of permanent storage of data in single-board computers. This is due to the fact that it overcomes the major disadvantage of the PROM device, its inability to be programmed more than once. Modern EEPROMs can typically be programmed and erased and reprogrammed hundreds of times and still maintain reliability. Here you see a typical memory cell in an EEPROM device. Notice that it uses metal oxide semiconductor MOS technology. The EEPROM memory cells contain a floating gate. The floating gates are small semiconducting regions placed between two metal levels. This in effect places a capacitance within the device. The electrical characteristics of the floating gate are carefully selected so that its polarity is not affected by the normal plus 5 volt operating conditions. An EEPROM will contain a matrix of these special MOS transistors. To better understand how the EEPROM is capable of storing information using MOS technology, we'll examine this simple circuit. To start with, a factory fresh EEPROM will contain a high at all memory addresses. Therefore, when the EEPROM is programmed, the high bit is converted to a low. When a positive 5 volts is applied to this simple circuit, we see that the current flows from ground through resistor R1 and into the drain of the MOS device. As you recall from your semiconductor theory on MOS devices, the gate must have a positive potential applied before a current will flow between the drain and source. The floating gate in this MOS device will prohibit the main gate from affecting the conductivity of the transistor. This results in the transistor remaining off. Therefore, only a very small amount of current made up primarily of minority charge carriers will flow through the device. This very small current flow then proceeds out the source into resistor R2, then into the positive side of the power source. Since the majority of the voltage is being dropped across the MOS device and the output is being taken from the source lead, then the output of the device will become a high. Now let's assume that the MOS device has been programmed to store logic zero. As you can see, the floating gate within the MOS device has become charged. We will see how this happened in a few minutes. When the positive 5 volts is applied to the circuit, the current will flow through resistor R1, then through the MOS device from the drain to the source then through resistor R2, and then to the positive side of the power source. As you notice, the current was able to flow through the MOS transistor due to the charge being applied at the floating gate. In effect, the floating gate biased the transistor on, allowing the current to flow. Since the transistor is biased on, its resistance drops to a very low value, which results in the majority of the voltage being dropped across resistor R2. This causes the bottom of resistor R2 to effectively be placed at ground potential. Since the bottom of resistor R2 is placed near ground potential, so is the output, which results in the output becoming low. As you can see, by placing a charge on the floating gate, we have succeeded in storing a logic zero in this memory cell. Now let's see how this cell is programmed. Programming an EEPROM is very similar to programming a standard PROM device. With this exception, the EEPROM is not burned, it is charged. A special EEPROM programmer is used to select the desired address to be programmed. Then it places the desired binary information at the control gate of the device. The EEPROM is then pulsed with a high energy pulse which locks the bit information into the substrate of the chip. The bit of information is stored in the floating gate where it remains even after programming voltages are removed. To erase an EEPROM, it is necessary to remove the charge stored on the floating gate of the device. This is accomplished through the use of ultraviolet light energy. Since light energy is used to erase the data stored in an EEPROM, most EEPROM devices will have a transparent window that permits the memory circuits to be exposed to the ultraviolet energy. 
When the ultraviolet energy is exposed to the memory elements, the short wavelength of the UV light causes the molecules to become excited and randomly move within the substrate. This allows the stored charge to dissipate. Gradually the IC will return to its pre-programmed state. It takes an average of 15 to 30 minutes of exposure to a concentrated ultraviolet light source to erase an EEPROM. After an EEPROM has been programmed, it is recommended that you place an opaque material over the transparent window of the device. This is necessary because common sources of light such as sunlight, room fluorescent lights and black light may contain enough ultraviolet energy to trigger random charge dissipation, which will introduce errors into the device. It is possible to store multiple programs in a single EEPROM IC, providing of course each program is stored at a different address. Also the entire EEPROM does not have to be programmed at once. However, once a bit has been programmed to a zero or low, it cannot be changed back to a one or a high unless the entire IC has been erased.